This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. And thank you for joining me today. With me is Richard Fields on your left and John Cameron on your right. And I don't necessarily that means anything in the left-right perspective these days because it doesn't actually exist. <laughs> the, this whole left-right paradigm, it doesn't really exist. The political left, the political right, they're all, I, I've gotten to the conclusion that, you know, there's a horseshoe theory about politics. It's, it's just not a horseshoe, it's a circle. It, <laughs> you go far enough left or far enough right, you end up in the exact same spot. But speaking of ending up in the same spot, um, the Supreme Court has issued a lot of rulings, and one of those was connected with California's AB5. That was the anti-gig worker bill, as we're going to call it. And the Supreme Court didn't issue a stay, so now independent owner-operators, truckers, are under threat from this having their lifestyle completely changed, and for us, our supply chain completely disrupted, because... Up to 70,000 trucker independent owner operators are now going to have to change the way they do business. And the impact that that's going to have on the economy and California's uh, supply chains is uncertain, shall we say. Well, I think change the way they do business is kind of an understatement. They're either going to have to go to work for the man, uh, you know, with full, you know, join the Teamsters and all that, or they're going to have to uh, move out of state. They don't have the ability to run their own business anymore. It's a, uh, a bill that uh, was expressly designed by unions and by uh, large trucking companies to put competition out of business. I absolutely agree. Um, and it's it's a horrible, you know, the uh, when immigrants come into this country, they typically, uh, unlike people who've been here for generations, they see that uh, with <clears throat> with uh, very little licensing, except for in this case a truck driver's license and, and some experience driving truck, uh, scraping together all the money they can they can find and living like third generation or even second generation people here would be unwilling to live. Um, they can start uh, a trucking business and they can uh, provide for their families. I know uh, many Ukrainian immigrants whose, whose uh, fathers worked at, at pretty uh, skilled jobs in the Ukraine, but they found the, the, uh, the layer upon layer of uh, the uh, regulatory states barriers. Uh, they couldn't climb it, but they, what they could do is drive truck. So they put in 60 hours a week on the road uh, so that they can provide for their family. Same thing with Sikhs, same things with uh, Hispanic people. So you basically taken away the ability for the people to come in and provide for their families. And you've taken away um, uh, the, the cushion in our um uh, I hate to say our infrastructure, the infrastructure. I hate to even use that freaking word because it's been perverted so bad by the socialists in power right now. You know, when when uh, you need to get some extra shipping, then you put a bid out and these guys bid on it and uh, the most competitive rate comes in. And if your trucking fleet can't handle it or if you don't want to send it over one of the big boys, one of these independents will take care of you. If they got slack in their schedule, one of these independents will take care of you when nobody else will touch the job. And on and on and on and on. And doing this is crazy. And as Richard said, it is absolutely a power grab by the unions. It's a power grab by our government to try to, uh, to pay off the unions, which keep them in business. If it wasn't right for the unions, the Democrats would never have, have anybody in office. And um, a power grab by the big, big uh, trucking companies. And it's despicable. It's despicable. Yeah, and the whole thing is they, they push this AB5 through essentially to, to try to tell people they were protecting gig workers, right? You know, app-based gig workers. But yet then they caught everybody under their grandma under this law. And it was deliberate. And it's, it was a, a perfect example of astroturfing, of how unions astroturf the, uh, the whole movement, essentially, by essentially lying. To just mm. be honest, they lied about what people wanted. They, mm. they lied about what independent contractors actually want out of life. They keep saying that we want these benefits when we call them chains. You know, as, as a as an ex-gig worker now, I suppose, we call these benefits or chains to us. Hmm. Those are well, and, I'm, 
And it goes worse than that. I mean, w there's also a free speech aspect of this, which people are, are not generally aware of. In a time of uh, declining media uh, uh, viability, newspapers are dying left and right because they can't compete with the Internet. Same way with uh, radio stations and TV station news operations. Uh, there were there was a healthy uh, industry of people who would sit at their uh, uh, computer uh, at home and uh, do independent uh, research uh, uh, reporting. And that has gone by the wayside as in well California. in yeah. California because they can't do it as a gig worker. They can't do it on a by story basis. They're told you have to go to work for a legacy media company most of which are falling by the wayside and certainly for the most part they're not hiring or uh you know find another line of work good luck with that mm -hmm. uh it's it's you know and that has had the very real effect of making the number of voices that you can uh listen to or read or hear in the media in california decline dramatically sure you can find some uh, uh free stuff on the web or you can you know read and believe the Sacramento Bee or the LA Times, good luck with uh, any uh, uh, factual reporting coming out of those sources. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a frontal assault on the, on the uh, freedom of press. And I think that also uh, is part of the uh, actual uh, purpose of AB5. Of course it is. Of course it is. And well spoken, Richard. Um, yeah, the, I think Vox, was it Vox? Uh, fired uh, 400 uh, independent workers that were for him. And so now what you get is you get the one message, the state is good, the state is right, the state should have more power. Uh, you get, you know, all the woke stuff. You get the, the incessant driving of the message that, that uh, uh, you're being preyed upon if you're of a certain race and the only way you can be rescued is by us making laws to take money from one person and give it to another and and it's this constant barrage of bs and uh yeah so yeah, I, just, I agree yeah it's this constant desire to control kind of the output of and the culture of people and it's a spreading it's a growing problem and dutch farmers are now revolting against these uh, green policies that are passing out that the uh they're trying to make farmers become green but of course these these people who push past these regulations you know, they're carpet walkers. You've never spent a life on a farm and, you know, spent a day on a farm in their lives. And so they're so they passed all these regulations without having any idea about the long term consequences on not just the the economy, but the culture and the society that the farmers live They're completely Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can speak to that. I grew up on a farm and when I was growing up a farm back in the uh, uh, in the dark ages of the 1950s and 1960s, the uh, output of corn in Minnesota was, if you could get 100 bushels an acre in a good year, that was, that was fantastic. 100 bushels of corn per acre. Now, on that same farm, I still own the farm, we can get 200, 300 uh, or more bushels per acre. Why? Because of the use of the kinds of phosphates and fertilizers that Holland is saying you can't use those anymore because well, we think they might uh, cause global warming somehow or another. The, the science is silly because the more green stuff you grow, the more carbon dioxide you take out of the atmosphere. So the, the, their science is, is, is screwy. And they're saying that essentially farmers uh, are not going to be allowed to produce at 21st, 22nd, what, 21st century levels, you're going to go have to go have to go back to uh, producing at 1950s or 1960s levels at a time when we're facing uh, imminent, not yet, but imminent famine in uh, South Africa because of the uh, wars that we're conducting in in uh, that are being conducted in the Ukraine and between Russia and Ukraine. So, not at a time of food imminent food shortages, the Dutch government under the uh, uh, under the thumb of, of the European European Union is saying to farmers, you can't produce as much anymore. You have to take your farting cows. You have to kill a bunch of your cows because they fart too much, uh, causing carbon dioxide, all in the name of the, uh, uh, I don't know whether it's true or not, whether or not cow farts cause global warming, but the bureaucrats in the Eurozone are absolutely certain that they do. And then Richard, I've 
it, I'm not a farmer, but when, when I was raising money for an organization, worked with a lot of farmers, and I sat across the table from them, that they're, when you talk to these so-called liberals, socialists, they, they think that somehow modern mechanized farming is worse for the land than before. Now, how many times did in the 60s or 50s did you have to uh, till the soil to get a crop? How many times did you have to touch the soil? Well, I'd have to count. We had to uh, plow. We had to disc. We had to drag. We had to plant. We had to rotary hoe. We had to cultivate four times. Uh, that's nine so far. Then we had to uh, spray a couple of times. That's uh, 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 11. Then we had to uh, uh, harvest. Uh, so you end up with a total and, and, and disc once more before you plow. So you end up with about a dozen times over the land. Each time you cross the land, you compact the soil. Now you go across the land twice, once to plant and once to harvest. Everything else is done essentially uh, either through uh, through uh, through chemicals or through uh, other other means that make it much easier on the land and on the environment. Reduces the amount of erosion that takes place, which means that less of our uh, rich uh, turnips and farmland is being washed down the Mississippi River and, and collecting in the Delta. It means that good farming practices not only provide uh, a, a doubling or a tripling of, of the amount of food available, but you also have uh, do it, you're doing it with a lot, a lot, a, a lot more uh, friendliness to the soil and, and to the uh, and to the environment. And remember, not that long ago, it was probably 30 years ago, but it feels like just yesterday because I'm, I'm pretty old myself, um, that, that one of the major problems facing this country and all agricultural countries was soil erosion. And soil erosion isn't even mentioned in the news anymore anywhere because of the, the advances in farming. There's still erosion. And I, 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 can we make a note to talk about Sri Lanka and its ecological nightmares and the other nightmares in a future show? Maybe next week I could do that. Make a note, John. All right. So same kind of craziness there with some economics craziness thrown into it as well. Well spoken, everyone. Yeah. And we talked about, uh, Richard was talking about earlier about how these AB5 and these kind of rules also limit the ability to, for free speech. But one of the other things, you know, free speech and book burning, it's in, in the news these days. But there was a there's an article in Reason about the sensibility of readers is a lot of books are actually getting banned. And John, maybe you can speak to this being an author. A, a lot of books are being banned before they even actually hit the shelves. They're being banned in the screening process. And a lot of ideas are being banned in the screening process. So you don't have to ban a book if you just don't allow it to get published in the first place. And it's well, this is, uh, if you got about three hours, now I'll try to keep it real short. So I I'm, I'm, uh, have just finished rewriting my three books to make it more commercially palatable. And uh, um, James Patterson came out and said that uh, the, the authors that are being uh, um, suppressed right now are old white guys. And then he quickly withdrew that comment because he didn't want to, you know, become actually banned, not just commercially banned. So I, uh, a couple of years ago, this is two years ago, I was starting my search again for, for agents. And invariably, these are young uh, people who worked in publishing. They went to liberal arts schools. Uh, I think their, their bias about is 80% 80, 80 female to 20% male. And they're all looking for books from underrepresented voices, uh, people of color, LBGTQ, whatever. I don't know. I don't know all the acronyms and all the rest of that. This is what we're looking for. And um, so uh, a great book that doesn't have uh, a gay character, a character, trans character, all the rest of that uh, will be rejected out of hand. And then if it turns out that, that you are not, uh, for, you know, new authors, a lot of them, um, there's, I think it was in actually the reason story that uh, we're referring to, great organization. Um, publishers were very, very excited about the book they got in, and they, they thought that the, by the name of the person who wrote it, they were a black author. And it had a black uh, a protagonist and uh, a bunch of people of underrepresented voices. And they got all excited. Then they met the guy. Turned out he was from the Philippines. And they went, whoa, stop. 
And then they, they ran the book through their screening process and they hired a, uh, a young woman to make sure it actually represented the, uh, uh, the black American from the streets who grew up uh, in poverty and all the rest of that uh, accurately. And the woman they hired to, to assess this was uh, uh, born in the UK and went to Oxbridge. So she had a really, really strong understanding of uh, what it was like to be a young black man in Compton. So this kind of craziness is, is going on. And it's, it's uh, most obvious in the public publishing industry when you're trying to get books published. So uh, uh, it's, it's been going on. It's just now coming to the forefront. If you go to any uh, agent site right now and look down the list, uh, you'll find an inordinate number of agents looking for that. They backed off from it slightly. They've made it less public now. But what will happen if your book gets into the mix and it doesn't sound like you're from Uganda uh, or your name used to be Mary and your name Joe, uh, then um, good luck getting through that screening process. All of which makes, uh, on the optimistic side, make, makes uh, uh, outfits like Substack uh, a lot more uh, palatable and uh, a lot better source of getting uh, good, balanced uh, supply of reading material as mm -hmm. opposed to uh, getting what's force fed to you by publishers as well as the mass media. Mm. Actually, I was just talking about thinking about Substack. And uh, so that, you know, that what a lot of authors are doing now, a lot of very successful authors started out, you know, self publishing. And once uh, the thing about publishing is that once you demonstrate that you have a money stream, then somehow all the parameters used, uh, all the parameters used to identify the potential money stream go out the window. And the, the, the green that's coming through the door of the publishing house wipes away everything else. But the problem is getting there. And uh, it's, it's much worse in the, in the U.S. It's starting to be, unfortunately, they say, U.S. When the when the U.S. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know where it's coming from. When the U.S. sneezes, the the U.K. catches a cold. All the craziness that we're doing here is starting to go over there. But they're uh, they have they have uh, some they have a bunch of competing newspapers with competing voices, national newspapers in that country. So at least you 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 hear when people uh, object to it. And I think I'm done with that. Yeah, I could yeah, go in. But yeah, that was a weird intro there. I don't know what the heck that came from, Chuck. I don't know. <laughs> All of a sudden, we started playing music. <laughs> um, yeah, so this interesting—it's it's such an interesting time that we live in. With we have people complaining about book burnings and bannings and and you know uh, cancellations, you know, but yet we don't actually pay attention where it actually happens structurally. That that or we. We sometimes do, right? We kind of care. We understand that, hey, sometimes we have these voices that were excluded. So our solution to that problem is to deliberately exclude other voices. And it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And we, it's no s surprise to me that we're in this kind of strange, convoluted society at the moment. Well, can I, can I add actually one more thing? And I will try to be quick. So yeah. if, you, if you watch it, uh, any... Uh, television show, uh, you know, this about fire, police, hospital, and uh, and and especially the 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 crime dramas and the thrillers and all the rest of that. Uh, invariably, the evil character is a corporation. Uh, we've decided they're an entity, and I agree with that. And the good people uh, who are fighting against the evil corruption caused by this corporation are invariably government employees. They are policemen, they are FBI agents, they are they're lawyers, or they're, they're, uh, they're reporters who are exposing this, this horrible corruption. And, and throughout the plot of these, these popular entertainment books, these people who work for the government repeatedly violate every single law you can think of. They break and enter, they threaten, they torture, uh, they kidnap, they do all of these things that would get ordinary citizens thrown in jail and because they're fighting the evil of corporations it's completely okay and this is a constant message that 
popular media in in on television shows and in movies uh, puts out. There's no other messaging out there. It's just not there. No, it actually brings it up to our our final story here that we're going to get a chance to cover is that these shows, they kind of distort justice, as you as you kind of call it. But our founders actually had a way of counteracting that distortion of justice, right? They like jury trials because a jury can sit there and make a judgment call. They don't have to follow the letter of the law. They can follow morality and ethics. Juries, mm -hmm. right, juries have that power. And so the founders loved jury trials. The founders wanted every... But we don't have jury trials anymore. Most things are pled out or you even just don't even go. If you have a, a minor traffic thing, you don't even see a judge. You get some commissioner person who just rubber stamps whatever he decides based upon hmm. what <laughs> just kind of it's not even a I don't even call it. It's not even a legal process. It's, it's just some dude sitting there making a decision. <laughs> and so how do we transfer back to a, a a society, I suppose, where we, these average people have more say in what actually happens legally. Because as you just explained, we've done, that our, culturally, we're used to being violated. We're used to having our laws, the government violating their own laws, and it's kind of become normalized. Richard, for shot. Well, uh, yeah, you, there, there's a, a couple of things there. One is the whole concept of plea bargaining, and something like 97%, according to the Reason article, of uh, criminal charges are plea bargained. And the, the technique is fairly simple. We have such a multitude of laws and regulations that, uh, as one uh, author uh, pointed out, three, three felonies a day. We're all guilty of three felonies a day. So if you're uh, charged with, I don't know, shoplifting or, or, you know, or, or burglary or whatever, if you're charged for something, you're not guilty doesn't make any difference as far as the prosecutors are concerned. They want to have uh, have have a, a, a guilty verdict, and if they if the charge has been brought, they want to make sure that the the guilt, guilty verdict uh, uh, you know uh, succeeds. And it's real easy for them to do that simply by st stacking charges. Uh, they'll find a half a dozen different things that they can charge you with, uh, and it's it's a it's common practice. They'll. Uh, you know, let's say you're guilty, uh, you're, you're, you're charged with burglary, you're not guilty, uh, but you're also charged with a whole uh, parcel of other things like, uh, I don't know, jaywalking and, and uh, uh, trespassing and uh, illegal entry, you know, whatever. Some of which you, in fact, may be guilty of. To commit, conspiracy to commit burglary. Yeah, conspiracy. There you go. Uh, and conspiracy shouldn't even be a crime, but it is. Uh, and uh, so they'll say, okay, you're, you're facing, you know, you can you can plead to the uh, burglary uh, charge and you'll do a year or two. Or we can throw the book at you for all of these charges that we've come up with and you'll be put away for life. Which is it? Hmm. And any sensible person will say, you know what? Uh, I think I'll take the two or three years. Uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to I'm not going to roll that dice. Hmm. So that's 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 how it works. That's how it works in the real world with the uh, three percent of trials that uh, do go to a jury uh there's another thing that's go that goes on which is the uh, bias against letting jurors make up their mind i'm talking about the uh the uh right the jury nullification the right of jurors to say you know what this guy may be technically guilty of violating this law but it's a dumb law that you know drug laws is a good example gambling any, any vice law gambling laws whatever mm -hmm. uh the the law is a dumb law he's guilty of it we don't care we're going to find him not guilty because the law is wrong it's called jury nullification and judges and courts uniformly and almost universally uh give a lecture to the uh to every jury saying your job is to judge the facts not to make a decision about the law. The law is a given. You can't have an opinion on that. You have but to. But you say, can. Yeah, you. But, but the judges are telling the jurors you have to make a decision entirely upon the facts in the case, whether or not the technicalities of the law have been violated. What's actually true is that jurors have all the. They can do whatever they damn well please. Once you're on a jury in a jury room, you can say 
that is the dumbest law I've ever heard. I don't care whether the guy's guilty or not. I am voting for acquittal. That's the right of jurors, and they can't do anything to you. That's your uh, right. And uh, in most uh, in, in most cases, you have to have a, a supermajority of jurors or a major or a or a unanimous verdict in order to convict. So jurors have the power to reverse a whole lot of uh, uh, bad laws simply by not convicting people. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that is uh, something that the that the government does everything in their power to make sure that that doesn't become common knowledge, even to the point of, of uh, if people pick it outside of a courtroom during a, a big uh, trial saying, uh, you know, trying to handle out FIJA uh, pamphlets, uh, the uh, right of a, of a jury to, you know, to, to uh, not convict, uh, they'll get arrested. The pamphleteers will get arrested for uh, putting, uh, putting out information. That's true, but doesn't uh, work for the uh, prosecuting uh, government. And there's, 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 it, this, this again could be a two hour show. We, Richard and I worked for an organization that uh, defended a, uh, a guy who owned a fourth generation commercial landscaping business who plowed a field. And the government decided uh, that, that he ripped the field, which ripping means breaking up the clay layer even though they had no evidence of it. And the, the biggest holes in, in the farmland when they tried to find evidence of it were the ones they dug trying to find evidence of it. And two years after this, this supposed uh, uh, ecological nightmare on 400 acres of, of uh, grassland, uh, you couldn't tell the difference in the before and after pictures because he stood up and said, I didn't rip the land. Uh, and, uh, and, and he was the nail that was sticking up. They went after him. They went after him with tooth and nail. They threatened to destroy in public. They said they were going to destroy his business. They were going to pierce the corporate veil and go after uh, personal assets because this was a corporation that uh, they were going to put him in prison and on and on and on and on. And, and if you'd have gone to a jury trial, who knows where in California, in, in this part of California, he would probably been, uh, he would have probably been exonerated completely of all charges. But I, I sat in the courtroom watching the judge throw out all evidence supporting him and keep all the quote unquote evidence otherwise. So I know we're wrapping up, but it's horrible. And basically what it is, extortion and threats on the part of the government to force you to settle. And he ended up settling. Yeah. For millions yeah, you know, and millions of dollars, it, it, it because was, he didn't want to—he didn't want to risk the the livelihoods of 500 employees and their families and destroy the legacy of a fourth generation thriving business. So he paid—I don't know what he paid. I don't know if it's public. I don't know if the the settlement is public knowledge, but it was a bunch. It was a bunch. But, yeah, we say we're we say we're a country of laws, we're the, the the rule of law. But you know what? If your government in the United States is supposed to be the government that follows the rule of law. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. It's time for us to go. Thank you all for watching us and see us next. See, we'll see you next week. Please remember, yes. love everybody. Looking forward to it. Thank, thank you, you, John. So thank you.